Hi, my name is Melissa Putman. I am an adult and pediatric endocrinologist at the Boston Children's Hospital CF Center and the Massachusetts General Hospital Adult CF Program. And uh, I also am involved in clinical research focusing on CF-related endocrine disorders, including bone disease and diabetes. And today, I'll be talking about advances in the treatment of CF-related bone disease. By way of disclosures, I have served as a consultant for proteostasis therapeutics in the past, and um, one of my research studies, which we'll discuss today, was funded by a Vertex Investigator Initiated Studies grant. So over the next 20 minutes, um, we will be discussing recent advances in our knowledge of the prevention and treatment of CF-related bone disease, really focusing on a kind of year-in-review type format where we talk about um, the big studies that have come out over the past two or three years. Um, and as we talk about these studies, we'll also highlight some of the future directions in the prevention and treatment of bone disease. Before we start talking about these studies, um, I think it would be helpful to kind of go through a little background about bone disease, just because this is not a topic that we tend to think about as often as other conditions in CF. Um, but I'll say that it is becoming increasingly important because as patients with CF live longer, we're finding that complications like bone disease is becoming increasingly prevalent and burdensome. And this slide shows the prevalence of osteopenia, osteoporosis, or fracture by age in 2017, showing the number of individuals affected uh, here on the left and the percentage of individuals um, with bone disease on the right. And what you can see is that really starting around the 20s, we see an increase in the prevalence of bone disease such that somewhere between 20 to 50 percent um, of adults are affected with this condition. And we know that young adults with CF have an increased risk of fracture, one that's more than double that of the healthy populations. Um, one recent systematic review found that the prevalence of vertebral fractures was, was 14 percent and non-vertebral fractures 20 percent for young adults with CF with a mean age of only 28 years old. Um, in addition, rib and vertebral fractures tend to be the most common types of fractures that we see in our patients with CF. And um, these can be associated with significant morbidity. So if you think about it, a rib fracture is going to be very painful. It's going to cause um, difficulty taking big breaths or coughing, and that might predispose to pneumonia or CF exacerbation. <coughs> By the same token, um, vertebral fractures can be very painful, um, but they can also lead to progressive kyphosis, which can affect um, chest wall expansion and ultimately impact lung function. And also, multiple vertebral fractures can be a contraindication to lung transplant. And so when we think about um, the treatment of bone disease and CF, we really think about it in terms of the non-pharmacologic interventions um, to optimize bone health and then the pharmacologic interventions. Um, and when we think about non-pharmacologic options, this is primarily focused on nutritional, so maintaining an optimal BMI, ensuring adequate calcium intake, providing vitamin D supplementation to reach your goal, 25 hydroxy vitamin D level, um, ensuring vitamin K supplementation. Uh, in addition, it's also important to, if possible, try to avoid or minimize any bone toxic medications like systemic or inhaled steroids, um, and also to encourage weight-bearing exercise as much as possible. And then also in our patients who do have low bone density, it's also important to make sure there's nothing else going on that could be contributing like hypogonadism or um, uh, celiac disease or hyperparathyroidism or, or other issues like that. In terms of pharmacologic treatments, these are basically the same as the interventions that we use in other osteoporosis populations. So there are anti-resorptive therapies that um, stop bone breakdown, and this includes bisphosphonates, which are the first-line treatment options for uh, patients with CF and have been 
by far studied the most in this patient population. And these phosphonates have been shown to improve bone density in, um, in uh, children and adults with CF, although fracture data are limited. Um, selective estrogen and receptor modulators are treatments for postmenopausal women only uh, that have not been studied uh, in CF patients. And denosumab is a monoclonal antibody uh, against rake ligand that also uh, has not been studied uh, in CF. And then our anabolic therapies are those that actually build up bone um, for our patients. And this includes teriparatide, which is a PTH analog, and baloparatide, which is a PTHRP analog. And then romososumab was recently FDA approved, and this is a monoclonal antibody against gerostin. And um, anabolic therapies also have not been studied um, in any detail in CF. And so even before we start talking about our recent advances um, in this field, um, it should be pretty clear that there's still a lot that we don't know about um, how best to treat bone disease in, in our patients with CF and a lot of research that still needs to be done. So to start, I'd like to talk about estrogen in bone health in our patients with CF. Um, and we know um, that estrogen is critical for bone health, um, and yet there is very little published um, regarding estrogen treatment in women with CF. And this uh, study was um, actually, so recently published earlier this year, um, and it was actually first presented as uh, an abstract last year uh, at NACFC. And this is one of the few studies that have looked at oral contraceptive use and bone health in CF. And so this was a retrospective study that compared DEXA bone density results in 12 premenopausal women treated with estrogen compared to 37 women not taking estrogen. And overall, these women were taking um, uh, birth control pills that contained low dose estrogen. Um, and these women were found to have lower lumbar spine um, bone density Z scores, as you can see here, and lower femoral neck Z scores um, compared to those women um, who were not taking estrogen. Uh, other than the birth control pill use, um, there were no other significant differences between these two groups of women. And this is interesting because there really are a lot of benefits to using low-dose um, uh, oral contraceptive pills in women with CF. Uh, this, there's usually lighter periods and less concern about potential side effects of birth control pill use. Um, however, one of the theoretical risks is that you know, these low-dose estrogen pills may not contain adequate estrogen for bone health. Um, and this has been observed in studies in other patient populations, including healthy adolescents, um, but it's really never been looked at in CF. And so I think the study is important because um, it means that we may want to reconsider using low-dose birth control pills um, in women with CF who have low bone density or in those women who are being treated with low-dose um, uh, birth control pills and have low bone density, we may want to think about using moderate dose birth control pills or um, potentially patches if that would be uh, an option. Now these authors um, went on to expand on the last study to then look at longitudinal data in a larger number of women. And this is a study that is currently in press um, in the American Journal of Medical Sciences. Um, in this study, they looked at longitudinal data for 145 women um, with CF. And they found that um, relatively few women were taking estrogen therapy, only 44 of the 145 subjects. Um, and interestingly, they found that um, estrogen exposure up to age 21 was associated with improved bone density but that this effect was lost in women after age 21. And so I think this study, especially in combination with the last one we just talked about, really highlight the need for additional research on estrogen treatment in CF, you know, particularly focusing on what is the best dose of treatment and also you know, what is the best timing um, for treatment in terms of optimizing bone health in uh, women with CF. 
All right, and now I'd like to move on to talk about um, the impact of diabetes in bone disease. And so it is well known that type 1 diabetes is a risk factor for low bone density and fracture. And we also know that patients with type 2 diabetes also have a higher risk of fracture. But very little is known about CF-related diabetes and bone health. And so this was a cross-sectional study that was published last year in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. Um, and these uh, investigators compared 102 patients with CF, um, 19 of whom had CFRD, and they looked at DEXA bone density and bone turnover markers, comparing them between the patients with and without diabetes. Um, and although there was no difference in bone density between um, the diabetes versus the non-diabetes patients, they did find that markers of bone formation and bone resorption were reduced in patients with CFRD, and um, bone for, these bone turnover markers were negatively associated with fasting glucose levels. Uh, and I think that this study is interesting because it adds to the literature about what we know about the impact of diabetes on bone turnover. Um, and it also suggests that potentially uh, glycemia may be a target for improving outcomes in bone disease uh, moving forward. So now I'd like to move on to talk about advances in our knowledge about the role of CFTR in bone. And I'll say that over the past decade, we have learned more and more about the role of CFTR in bone cells. And this really is one of the really exciting um, uh, aspects of the field. And so studies have shown us that UCFTR is expressed in human osteoblast and in human osteoclast, and that CFTR dysfunction in mice and rats leads to compromised bone structure and bone density, um, and also abnormalities in bone turnover, even in the absence of pulmonary and GI disease. And we don't really know for sure what it is that CFTR is doing in bone cells, um, but studies suggest that it may be impacting how bone cells talk to each other via rank ligand and osteoprotegerin, which are mediators of bone remodeling. And so I want to take this opportunity to highlight um, this study that was published earlier this year in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis that investigates um, bone microarchitecture in CFTR deficient pigs which is um, a, a larger animal model than what we've seen in many other studies. And in many ways, pig bones are much more similar to human bones than smaller animals. And so this is an important contribution to the field. And what um, these investigators found were that the CFTR knockout pigs had lower cortical thickness, as you can see in uh, this picture right here. Um, compared to the wild type animals. And this was true for um, both the male and the female animals. In addition, the CFTR knockout piglets uh, also had greater cortical porosity, and that is depicted in these pictures right here. So the red uh, represents the pores within the cortical bone. You can very clearly see that there is greater porosity in the knockout pigs compared to the, the wild type. And again, um, this was true for both male and female animals. Um, in addition, the authors also found that the CF pigs had alterations in the composition of trabecular bone with higher carbonate phosphate ratio and also higher mineral crystallinity um, compared to the wild type animals. And so, um, this study provides you further evidence that CFTR dysfunction may be playing a primary role in the cortical and trabecular bone defects that, that were observed in these animals, particularly since newborn pigs would not be expected to be affected by infection and inflammation um, seen in, in older animals. Um, I also think that this is particularly interesting, interesting given the data that I'll show you um, in humans that we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. And so lastly, um, 
uh, I want to go through some of the recent advances in how CFTR modulators may impact bone health in our CF patients, which I think we can all agree is really one of the most exciting um, areas in this field. So at present, um, there are actually very few data investigating this topic. And this study is um, the first and the only one um, that was published uh, looking at, um, this, at uh, um, the effect of IVACAPTOR in um, patients with CF. And so this was a retrospective study um, looking at seven patients uh, with the G5F1D mutation who were treated with IVACAPTOR for one to three years. And what they found was that those patients um, treated with IVACAPTOR started out with a lumbar spine Z-score of minus 1.1, and then after one to three years of treatment had increases in their lumbar spine Z-score to minus um, 0.4. So had improvement in um, their bone density with treatment. They also had improvement in pulmonary function and weight with treatment. And so, so really this study um, suggests that IVACAPTOR could be having um, a beneficial effect uh, in bone density in treated patients. And so further building on, on um, that publication, uh, I wanna talk to you about the results of our study that have not yet been published, um, but were presented at last year's NACFC conference and are currently under review. Um, and so this was a prospective multiple cohort study in children and adults. We enrolled 26 subjects with CF and the GF and the G551D mutation as they started treatment with IVA capture after FDA approval. And then we enrolled 26 subjects with CF uh, who served as CF controls who were not taking IVA capture. And then lastly, we uh, enrolled 26 healthy volunteers. And each of these three cohorts were age, race, and gender matched um, with the other. And we evaluated subjects at baseline one year and two years. And we obtained DEXA bone density results. And we also looked at high resolution peripheral quantitative CT. And so this is an advanced imaging modality that provides data regarding the microstructure of bone, looking at, at specific details of cortical and trabecular bone um, of, of the distal radius and distal tibia in three dimensions. So it basically provides like a virtual bone biopsy um, of these bones. And then we also collected data on um, clinical status, pulmonary function, physical activity, body composition, and um, bone health labs uh, over this two-year period. And we did not find any differences in change over time in DEXA bone density measures. Um, and we also didn't find any differences in any bone outcomes in children. However, we did find that the adult subjects that were treated with IVA capture um, had increases in cortical uh, area, which is here in the black bars, as you can see, um, at both the tibia and the, and the radius, the tibia and the radius. Um, they also had uh, reductions in trabecular area at both sites um, and increases in cortical volume as well. Um, and then these patients also here at the bottom had um, increases, uh, significant increases in cortical porosity at both the radius and the tibia, which is really suggestive of um, an, uh, an increase in underlying bone remodeling that's going on uh, in the cortical bone. And so since cortical bone provides a majority of the strength of the skeleton, um, these findings may have important implications on fracture risk for patients with CF. And so really further studies will be needed to understand the implications of these findings and to learn how Trikapta will impact bone health in patients now that it's uh, widely available. So to summarize, um, uh, I hope I've convinced you that it's been an exciting few years in uh, CF bone disease. Um, we've learned that low dose OCPs may be detrimental for bone health in women with CF, but the optimal dose and timing of estrogen treatment is unclear. In addition, um, CFRD may have an impact on bone turnover in patients with CF, and if it does, then glycemic control could represent a potential target for treatment. And 
In addition, um, we have learned more evidence supporting the role of CFTR as playing a direct, having a direct impact in, in bone. And um, treatment with Ivacaptor in adults with the G551D mutation um, had an impact on cortical microarchitecture in treated patients. And further studies will be needed to understand the effect of CFTR modulators on bone health, particularly with the advent of Tricaptor. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this symposium, um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you to the moderators for the invitation to speak in Symposia 20 Clinical Year in Review on the topic of new insights in CFTR modulator therapies. My name is Marty Solomon. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm the Adult CF Center Director as well as an Associate Science specializing in clinical and translational research in UAB's Gregory Fleming James CF Center. This slide details my industry and non-industry grant funding, as well as advisory board memberships and consultancy. The outline of this talk will center around reviewing the newest CFTR modulators in development and new understandings of the clinical effects of modulators currently approved along three themes. First, expanding access for currently approved modulators. Next, expand, expanding the horizon of the number of available modulators. And finally, expanding knowledge about mechanism and long-term effects of those modulators. First, we'll look at the expanding access of approved CFTR modulators. This timeline, beginning in 2012, traces the increase of adults and older children in the U.S. with approved modulators targeting their genotype. As you can see, with the landmark approval of Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, or ETI therapy, 85 to 90 percent of patients in this age bracket had an approved FDA modulator that was clinically significant. However, this leaves a few important groups out which we'll touch upon today. The first is those 10 or more percent of patients with rare mutations and non-responsive mutations to ETI therapy, as well as children of younger age brackets who do not yet cur currently have approved modulators in any of these categories. This slide takes a similar stance and looks at the recent expansions along the age spectrum from birth to adult, which have occurred the last year in review. Notably, Ivacaptor is now FDA approved for all Ivacaptor responsive patients with mutations greater than or equal to six months old. And there's ongoing studies, which should near conclusion soon, in infants less than six months old, so from birth and beyond. The original F508 modulators, including the combinations Lumacaptor, Ivacaptor, and Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, have ongoing regulatory approvals for Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, and the other combination for current FDA indications in other arenas outside of the U.S. And perhaps most importantly, and most recently, the FDA has approved Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor to the 6 to 12-year-old age bracket in just this month in 2020. In addition, Phase three results demonstrate a benefit as an add-on for TES IVA or IVACAPTOR in F508 residual function or gating mutation patients previously taking those therapies, indicating effectively and proving that all patients with F508 DEL in one or more alleles will have effectiveness in treatment with ETI therapy. In addition, there's been evidence uh, from a recent study led by uh, Birmingham and others, and please see poster 645 in the live stream workshop, that there's efficacy of ETI therapy in advanced lung disease patients. This data shows that in comparison to pre-ETI therapy, patients had a significant increase in lung function, which correlated to their previous severity of lung function. And perhaps most importantly, these patients had improved post-transplant outcomes, indicating that many of them were able to be removed from the transplant list due to increasing lung function, and uh, after transplant-focused discussions. Now we'll take a look at the expanding landscape of modulators. As we know, to cover all patients and for maximum efficacy, other modulators with different biology will be necessary uh, to expand our horizons. This slide takes a look at the various approved modulators 
including Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor, and Tezacaftor, and Alexacaftor, which are currently approved, along the lines of the cell machinery in the transcription to translation process, which by, whereby cells have active CFTR. As you can see, there are new drugs that are on the horizon, which include stabilizers and amplifiers of mRNA, which we'll explore in a few moments, as well as the concept of premature termination codon suppression or read-through agents, which while not strictly speaking modulators of CFTR function, do augment the cell machinery and production of protein through the transcription to translation process, thereby effectively allowing for future modulation of these proteins after that read-through process. So in summary, there are several approved and, and, and under investigation modulator types, which include correctors and potentiators, which we're, most of us are well familiar with, stabilizers, which prevent the premature termination, premature turnover of defective proteins at the cell surface, and that includes the Novalis compound, which did not reach uh, patient approval in phase three studies, enhancers and amplifiers, which increase the amount of mRNA present at the cells uh, for, uh, tran for transcription and translation. Uh, and an example of this is the currently investigated PTI-428 compound, uh, which is in uh, phase three studies in triple combination with correctors and potentiators by proteostasis. And of course, the aforementioned uh, premature termination suppressors and read-through agents, which, uh, as previously mentioned, are not strictly modulators, but do work at the protein machinery level to improve CFTR function. Let's look at the proteostasis compounds. As you recall, recall the drug PTI-428, now known as Nisolacaftor, uh, is currently under investigation in triple combination with a potentiator and corrector by proteostasis in two trials, which will have results, we hope, in the coming years. The first of these is the Moore study, which will use the treatment combination in a larger set of homozygous f 508 del patients to get to support approval of this drug, hopefully by the US FDA. The next will use a novel design called Choices to test optimizing therapy combinations using organoid therapies prior to administering them to patients. So please look up for these on the horizon uh, and in future uh, presentations. So other miscellaneous updates with modulators include the recent expansion of, F of ETI with an NDA for rare mutations that will cover an additional 600 patients uh, that would be previously not responsive to ETI therapy based on in vitro data. That was a recent Vertex press release. In addition, there is ongoing study by Vertex, Galapagos, and others for once daily potentiators to simplify the drug regimen. There will be studies looking at a super corrector named, known as VX121 amongst others which are in the pipeline. And finally, there's ongoing testing of new potentiator therapies by several uh, pharma sponsors. So in thinking about the rare mutation population which we discussed earlier, I want to detail a bit about the development of strategies for, mo for advancing modulators in this rare population. One such study is the ongoing observational study known as the RARE study, which is looking at the concept of therotyping to advance modulator usage along with other new therapies in rare mutations. I would invite you to please review the details of this in the On-Demand Symposium 27, which I and others will be speaking about therotyping advances in the last year. The concept of therotyping was mo motivated by a landmark's finding uh, in which the Ivacaftor label was expanded uh, using in vitro methods, including FRT cells, which were then polarized and using CFTR activation assays, including oozing chambers. And this allowed expansion of Ivacaftor from its initial approved uh, mutations to additional set based on this in vitro data alone and led to an expansion of the FDA labeling uh, on that compound. With this exciting news, and which came out in 2017, the concept of expansion of CFTR modulators to new mutations that previously had not been expanded to in the concept of therotyping was brought to bear and increasing intensity for excitement was brought to this. The rare study amongst others will harness a variety of tissue sources from patient derived samples, use these sources in in vitro assays like epithelial culture or organoids, gene and protein expression assays, and in vitro cell properties of other types, and then ultimately 
develop these as biomarkers for correlation to clinical improvements observed with CFTR modulators to advance the clinical investigation of potential modulator therapies in previously unapproved uh, mutations. This may speed the access through regulatory or other sources, um, non-regulatory based, for access to patients which previously would not have access to these modulators under the current FDA label. In the rare study, we're currently targeting genotypes, including CF patients who are homozygous for two premature stop codons, who are complex heterozygous of a, a stop codon, who are complex heterozygous of a stop codon plus any of a number of other uh, uh, non-functional alleles which may uh, have modulo modulatable uh, function, and then CF patients of several other genotypes of interest. I would invite you to learn more about this in poster 391 and the workshop talk uh, led by the CFFT laboratory and Martin Mensa. Now, in addition to expanding the access of modulators and the, and the landscape of modulators, we also want to learn more about the effects of these modulators, both long-term and the mechanism by which they operate to improve all, all types of clinical outcomes. Several studies are endeavoring to do this, which I'll detail for you now. Perhaps the most sweeping of these is the PROMISE study, which is a prospective study to evaluate the biological and clinical effects of significantly corrected CFTR function with ETI therapy along three basic themes. First, understanding the biologic mechanism of the primary pulmonary effects observed in the initial labeling studies of ETI. Second is expanding the knowledge and understanding of mechanism and clinical outcomes in extra pulmonary effects of the drug. And finally, the durability of these clinical responses, both in pulmonary and non and extra pulmonary effects. Please see several abstracts, which I will detail a bit here, including abstracts 283, 451, amongst others throughout this conference. The concept of the PROMISE study was motivated by both other longitudinal studies, including the GOAL study, demonstrating long-term improvements and mechanistic advances uh, in IVACAFTA therapy for the initial FDA labeled indications, and other studies which have come out since then uh, of a translational and clinical nature, which include observations of improvement in CT score and mucus plugging with long-term therapy um, in, with IVACAFTR. The mechanistic understanding of, long, of IVACAFTR therapy improving mucociliary clearance, which may, may, may partially or fully predict the FEV1 improvement. Improvements in pancreatic function and GI function in children and adults amongst various modulator therapies which have been observed. And finally, the unanswered question of the inconsistent finding of improvements in chronic infection, microbi microbiome diversity, and chronic airways inflammation, which leaves a largely unanswered question, which we hope to further explore with the PROMISE study. The PROMISE study is designed as, as an observational study and an open label design which will establish a baseline, which has already happened for all these patients prior to ETI initiation. Then patients will have short-term and long-term benefit study visits to examine the short-term biological and clinical impact up through six months, and then through 12 to 24 months for long-term and maximum benefits. Now, COVID has of course interrupted a bit of this study design. However, we're back on track with the initiation of these visits and we've followed many patients at least through visit four uh, to date. In addition, you should be aware there are parallel and complementary trial designs that are being initiated in younger children with a PROMISE extension and BEGIN, which will use ETI therapy in a, in a, uh, a two-part study to look at younger children and into infancy. This data, courtesy of Dade Nichols and Steve Rowe, detailed in poster 230-283, uh, demonstrates the initial durability data of the clinical responses in changes of lung function, reduction of sweat chloride, improvements of the CFQR respiratory domain, and improvements of BMI, both percentile and absolute data. And this, this data, which demonstrates consistent improvements, uh, demonstrates that in all of the various uh, group study, those both on prior Tezacaftor or Lumacaftor therapy and those initiating initial modulator uh, that were F508 home heterozygotes, uh, there is significant durability of these clinical responses, at least out through uh, the initial uh, period of 180 days as detailed in this data. And I would invite you to review this um, throughout the, throughout the um, conference as well. 
So there are also some key mechanistic substudies, which will begin to answer questions about the extrapulmonary side effects, which are highlighted in these circles, uh, which would include several organ systems beyond the lungs, including the hepatobiliary tree, the pancreatic, pancreatic obiliary tree, the intestine, and, and the skin, uh, with some key mechanistic substudies, including mucociliary clearance and mucus properties, which is being led uh, at several centers, liver pathology, long-term effects on inflammatory markers, effects on growth and nutrition, and with several substudies underneath this, evaluation of pancreatic function and GI tract pH evaluation to answer many of these questions, both in the short and long-term in response to ETI therapy. Whether or not there will be an effect in the reproductive tract will be partially observed in the PROMISE study and will be largely an unanswered question, however. In addition to understanding the long-term benefit and mechanistic effects of ETI therapy. There's a, an unanswered question about whether highly effective CFTR modulation will be effective enough to allow withdrawal of other chronic respiratory therapies. This question is being partially tackled by the Simplify study led by Dave Nichols and Alex Gifford and Nicole Hamblett. Um, and I appreciate Dave Nichols for sharing these slides with me detailing this study. While this study is not yet initiated due to uh, COVID uh, precautions, we are hopeful for, uh, for data to emerge, to begin to emerge soon. So I'll outline the study. This study will have two study parts, study A and B, which will look at two primary hypotheses. Can we withdraw hypertonic saline? And is that non-inferior to remaining on hypertonic saline measured by the primary endpoint of FEV1? And a similar study design uh, for non-inferiority with the withdrawal of, of pulmozyme or DNA therapy. This study shows the stratification st style, uh, which will have several subgroups to an analyze the patients after their six week withdrawal period. The endpoints of this study uh, for the primary will be absolute change in FEV1, percent predicted from randomization to week six. Secondary endpoints will look at um, efficacy in changes of lung function in FEV1, uh, pr the proportion of subjects having uh, pulmonary exacerbations or other untoward pulmonary side effects, including hospitalizations, changes in symptom scores, and then the, the changes in treatment burden as a result of the study. And of course, there'll be safety endpoints as well. So with this review, I will conclude that there's promise for new modulators expanding to all patients with CF. Biorepositories and biomarkers, including the RARE study, are essential for acquiring a critical mass of tissue to test new therapies for rare mutations. Novel clinical designs paired with biomarkers may help to move drugs for people with CF who have rare mutations, and we are seeing, beginning to see some of that play, fact, play a fact. And significant investment in the next generation modulators and new understandings of the effect of these modulators is underway with several observational studies sponsored by the CF Foundation. With that, I'll conclude by acknowledging the patient participates in several of the studies which I've had a lead role on. My co-lead PIs, investigators, and research coordinators of several observational studies I've been fortunate to be involved with, members of my lab and mentors, and several collaborators across the country, and funding sources from NIH and CFF. Thank you very much. I would invite you to uh, email me with any questions at msolomon at uab.edu, and thank you again. Hello, my name is Ema Fitzpatrick. I'm a paediatric hepatologist at Children's, Children's Health Ireland and at King's College Hospital London. And over the next 20 minutes, I'm just going to go through um, some of the new developments in CF liver disease over the last year or so. I've no disclosures related to this presentation. I'm going to start with the definition of CF liver disease and where we are with the consensus around this, with particular focus on steatosis and on non cirrhotic portal hypertension. After this, I'm going to have a look at non-invasive detection and monitoring of CF liver disease and where we are with this. I'm going to talk about what we know so far about the effects of the CFTR modulators on the liver. And I'm going to end with a few slides on liver transplantation. So first of all, what's the consensus around the definition of CF liver disease? So we're still really in the midst of a transatlantic divide um, with Carla Colombo and, and Dominic Dubray, particularly in Europe, um, having a more uh, inclusive diagnosis of CF liver disease versus the US, which um, really 
pins down cirrhosis or portal hypertension as necessary for true CF liver disease. Uh, there was a consensus meeting a couple of years ago uh, and we eagerly await the consensus um, definition from that meeting and um, because I think this is really important when we're talking about prognostication and um, or indeed um, uh, clinical trials. We know that liver involvement in CF is the third leading cause of death. But again, it's a really varied picture. And if we're talking about abnormalities of biochemistry, this is very common. And uh, um, abnormalities of AST, ALT and gamma GT um, over a six month period can be present in at least a third of those by the age of 20. And the prevalence of, of steatosis um, is also uh, possibly on the rise. Um, ultrasound can detect 30% steatosis in the liver. And we're not quite clear yet if this is a, an under or perhaps even an overnutritional um, uh, um, uh, evolution. Cholangiopathy is being described more in, in adults now. And, and I'd also point out that when we screen infants um, who have an neonatal cholestasis for CF, um, we have described a, a bile, a biliary hypoplasia that's actually quite difficult to differentiate from something like biliary atresia. Um, gallstones, gallbladder problems, very common. Um, and a, a focal biliary cirrhosis, as you know, is, is described in up to 50% um, at explant. This is the true multi um, lobular cirrhosis um, at explant. We know from previous studies that there is a higher mortality associated with liver disease in cystic fibrosis than in, in, in persons with cystic fibrosis without liver disease. But because of the heterogeneity of, of the diagnosis, we're not quite clear if this really only applies to those with multi lobular cirrhosis and portal hypertension, or indeed this could also apply to those with steatosis or abnormalities of biochemistry. This brings me to steatosis. Um, and as mentioned, at, at autopsy, up to 60% of those with CF will have some degree of um, steatosis. In, in, our, in our cohort in, in Kings, 93 children, 30% um, were found to have steatosis on, on the routine surveillance ultrasound. And this was associated with female sex and um, cystic fibrosis-related diabetes or indeed an abnormal glucose tolerance test, but interestingly not age, BMI or enteral feeds. In the past, this patchy fatty change has, has been largely associated with um, deficiencies of essential fatty acids, choline or carnitine. And we wonder about that, that possible association with perhaps insulin resistance or, or abnormal metabolism, certainly um, uh, uh, related to, to the emergence of diabetes. I guess the real, really important question here is, is, does it matter? Does it matter in terms of morbidity or, or mortality? And, and what's the significance? Can children with, with fatty livers who, who have CF undergo the same changes as those with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, for example, with the development of fibrosis? I'm going to talk a little bit about portal hypertension. So this is a really nice study by Sapoli et al. looking at the prevalence of portal hypertension in a, in a group of 577 children with CF. And um, they clearly showed that there was a higher mortality and, and transplant occurrence in those with portal hypertension versus those without. And very interestingly, they found that early abnormalities of biochemistry when the children were less than six and a half years and was actually associated then with a risk of, of developing portal hypertension. So important for um, surveillance. Peter Witters and colleagues in 2011 described um, a, a curious finding in um, explants of uh, patients who underwent liver transplant for portal hypertension um, in that rather than an expected cirrhotic picture, um, they found that instead of this, there was actually um, not, not as significant fibrosis as expected. Instead, they found a predominantly uh, venopathic um, change in the liver with almost sclerosis of the portal vein. So this is a, a, a you know very well um, described in in in a, a non cirrhotic um, uh, nodular regenerative hyperplasia like picture. Um, but indeed that these livers were not cirrhotic. 
And this finding has been corroborated by two quite recent papers. The first in children, um, where um, Wu et al. examined 17 explants in pediatric patients who had undergone transplant for portal hypertension related to CF liver disease. And interestingly, 94% of cases had a nodular regenerative hyperplasia picture without cirrhosis. And you can see this in, it's quite a nice soft looking liver, you know, without those um, um, nodular changes of cirrhosis. In 10 adults, all who underwent liver transplant at the same time as lung transplant, um, uh, obliterative portal venopathy was, was found in eight. Um, and this paper very nicely speculates on, on the etiology or pathophysiology of this change um, related to the chronic inflammatory state in CF, perhaps infection, endotheliitis, a hypercoagulability and platelet activation. This brings me um, to the question of non-invasive biomarkers of disease. So we've long, um, certainly in, in King's, stopped biopsying children with cystic fibrosis in order to evaluate liver disease, mainly because historically we've always felt this change to be quite patchy. Um, and we rely on serum biomarkers, so your standard biochemistry um, or combinations like um, the AST to platelet ratio index. Um, we rely very heavily on imaging, particularly ultrasound, to evaluate liver parenchyma, spleen size, etc. And then more recently on transient elastography, RV, and MR scanning. Um, a more uh, research-based approach is that um, of nine hypothesis-driven um, glycomics, proteomics, metabolomics. The big problem here, though, is that the gold standard is quite slippery, and we still don't really know if we are looking for um, fibrosis or if we're looking for steatosis or what really makes a difference um, in CF in terms of, of prognosis. Um, Simon Ling et al. Um, uh, wrote a, a very interesting paper uh, looking at ultrasound. So um, their classification of ultrasound abnormalities, I think, is very important. So they classified uh, in patients with CF normal livers, um, nodular livers, heterogeneous liver. So classically, that's a heterogeneous echogenicity, so patchy, fatty, change-like like effect. Um, and then also homogeneous uh, echogenicity. So that would imply a more homogeneous steatotic picture. And they looked at ALT, um, gamma GT to platelet ratio, platelet count, spleen size, Z-score, APRI, and FIB4, which is another um, algorithm. And they found, as you would expect, the nodular liver scored quite highly for um, things like spleen size, ALT, um, uh, and APRI, and then it was lower in terms of platelet count. And um, the other categories, though, um, were, were, were reasonably similar. And it, it, but not, not significantly different from normal livers. Um, so what does it really mean to have a heterogeneous liver on ultrasound? I mean, is this patchy fatty change of any relevance? And this is a, a really nice study by Siegel et al, where they looked at um, an, a, a heterogeneous liver at baseline in children uh, versus normal liver appearance in children, and then followed them up and found that, that your nine times more likely to develop a nodular liver pattern if um, you have a heterogeneous pattern at, um, at baseline. Um, and I think this is important, but importantly, um, also not all of those with a heterogeneous picture at baseline went on to develop a nodular pattern. Transient elastography has um, really come to the fore across hepatology, and this is a bedside test um, which can essentially give a, a proxy marker of fibrosis or, or stiffness of the liver. So it uses ultrasound technology and a vibration transmitted transcutaneously into the liver. The faster the wave, the, um, the, the stiffer the liver. Um, and this is, is reported in, in kilopascals. Um, and this has been used in a number of studies in, in children and in adults with C. Um, however, we're stuck with the fact that actually we don't have a gold standard. So again, we're measuring different types of liver disease. We're measuring, measuring those who are clearly hybrotic and we're measuring those who are steatotic. So this systematic review really falls down in, um, in, in, in trying to tease this out. And you can see that the, the, the, the different kilopascals here that they use for cutoffs are, are really quite broad. Um, our group 
also had concerns in, in our own study where we looked at C, um, at uh, transit elastography and normal controls and in, in patients with CF. And the intra and inter observer variability was really quite significant. We felt that this just wasn't a reliable or a precise way of, um, of non invasively diagnosing fibrosis. RFI or acoustic radiation force impulse imaging is where an ultrasonographer selects an area of interest and again uses shear wave technology to tell how stiff that liver is. And I think that's probably going to give us a little bit more in terms of precision. But again, it is variable and, and probably depends on, on a number of external factors. I really think the world of MRI is, is, is an exciting one when we're talking about CF liver disease and, and probably research studies more so than, than screening because of, you know the feasibility and the expense of MRI is, is, is obviously significant. And multiparametric imaging, which, which can quantify fibrosis, uh, fibrosis here and um, also steatosis, I think could potentially be very useful in the context of CF liver disease. So essentially here, um, green is, is good, um, orange yellow and then red is bad. You can see that there's a good differential here in terms of different um, grades of steatosis and, and stages of fibrosis, zero to four. And um, MRE can be combined with this. And, and again, the idea here is that it shows you the entire liver and the stiffness of, of the entire liver. And I'm not aware um, that we've, we've been um, using this uh, extensively yet in the world of, of CF liver disease, but I, I really think that this is probably where the future lies. Now to move on to the CFTR therapies uh, and the liver, as, as you all know, um, at the very beginning of the CFTR modulator story, we were quite concerned that um, a, a rise in transaminases and, and particularly um, changes in those with, with established liver disease it could be a contraindication to using many of, the, of these um, drugs. Um, and in particular, US FDA submission of Arcambi um, described one out of seven patients um, who had cirrhosis who um, evolved to a pattern encephalopathy um, on starting the drug. Since then, a number of studies have been done, and in particular, a French study, which is a real life safety and effectiveness study of or can be in 553 adults, um, reported on um, discontinu discontinuation of treatment due to adverse effects. Interestingly, only 0.24% discontinued treatment because of abnormal LFTs. And this threshold is generally set at three times the upper limit of normal of ASD, ALT, gamma GT, plus twice the upper limit of normal of bilirubin. So very few actually achieved that, which is, is very reassuring. And indeed, this cohort, because it was a real life cohort, um, included cirrhotic patients. So again, this, this is, is, is reassuring using these drugs in patients with established liver disease. Um, a recent study in Tezicafter and Ivacafter in, in children. Again, out of 70, only seven developed uh, raised transaminases and none, um, no children actually had to discontinue the drug um, because of adverse effects in terms of transaminases or, or any liver dysfunction. Alexacafter plus Tezacafter plus Ivacafter in um, phase three adult study. Um, again, kind of single figures here with transaminases uh, over three times the upper limit of normal. And again, no one had to, to discontinue the drug because of um, liver adverse effects. A systematic review um, of all four um, uh, drugs here showed again that although the prevalence of, of abnormal LFTs was around 10% here, 20% here. And um, the, the, the rate of discontinuation of treatment was, was really low. Um, one possible um, adverse effect that has been associated from a liver perspective with um, uh, particularly, and this is a triple combination, is, is complications associated with gallstones. And, and the theory here is actually because the drug um, it allows the thick viscous bile to become thinner, pre-existing gallstones may then get into trouble. And this is um, a, a, a number of gallbladder complications temporarily related to starting the drug. However, on the other hand, we've seen a reduced hepatic steatosis uh, using or can be. And, uh, you know, again, this is, this is potentially um, very interesting in terms of pathophysiology and understanding what's going on with steatosis because um, our eyes have recently been open to the um, to the very um, uh, closely uh, associated effects of 
bioelastic composition and um, the metabolism. And we know that impaired bile acid homeostasis, not just in CF, but in other conditions, can lead to hepatic steatosis and, and a lipotoxicity. Um, and this is a really interesting area, which is, is, is going to explode, I'd say, over the next couple of years in terms of use of X, FXR agonists um, and, and bile acid reuptake inhibitors and, and how they might be used in CF liver disease. And just to mention too that actually a number of case reports have, have been quite reassuring in terms of the use of, of can be certainly um, and its enzyme inducing effect in the post-transplant um, population. So I think expecting uh, low levels of tacrolimus and, and preemptively increasing your dosage um, allows us to use um, both drugs effectively um, in, in these uh, patients. This brings me to my last few slides, um, and this is around liver transplantation. And, and you know, there's not been a huge amount in the literature most recently about liver transplant, but I still think it's a really important area to talk about and, and, and to, to try and push forward. We know, um, as opposed to, to previously, when, when we were worried about infectious complications and with immune suppression, et cetera, that survival in patients with CF and um, post-liver transplant is actually similar to that of other indications, i.e. it's excellent. Um, and there's a, a, a survival advantage over um, no liver transplant in patients with CF liver disease, but the timing is still really difficult. And, and it's even more difficult now that we know about this um, uh, nodular regenerative hyperplasia and actually you know, very few uh, children and adults end up with, with decompensated end-stage liver disease as opposed to have uh, complications of wart live retention. And um, the problem is that we've no real scoring, um, and this is an exception in terms of listing for transplant in, in, in mo most um, uh, um, uh, countries. Um, but, but clearly, I mean, you know, and, and this particular paper back in 2016 was, was tagged as actually CF, uh, our survival um, post-transplant for CF-associated liver disease was, was, was less good than liver transplant for other indications, but actually there's not much in it. And likewise, a combined liver lung um, ha has a, a, a good survival. Um, a, a recent, uh, again, consensus paper looked at um, the indications for liver transplant and, and the obvious ones, uncontrolled portal hypertension, synthetic dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, et cetera, are obvious. Less obvious is, is controlled portal hypertension, but you, you do wonder, um, particularly in those who, who may have evolving minimal hepatic um, encephalopathy, if sometimes um, a, a transplant might be indicated um, uh, you know, differentiating out poor growth and nutrition secondary to liver disease versus lung disease or CF-related diabetes is really tricky. The classic contraindications to liver transplant too need to be questioned all the time, and um, particularly multidrug resistant organisms, um, and, and how best we can manage those post-transplant. It's no longer an absolute contraindication to liver transplant. Thus, in summary, um, I've discussed the fundamental question of the definition and, and why it's so important to understand the pathophysiology um, in the context of this. Um, the biomarkers of CF liver disease are very linked to this condition and, and I think it's really important that we differentiate this out in order to, to use biomarkers properly in prospective longitudinal studies. I talked a little about the CFTO modulators and in general they seem to be well tolerated in, um, from a liver perspective both of those with and without um, CF liver disease and you know I'm really interested in the role of liver transplant in, in CF liver disease and I, I feel this is quite a moving target but we we need to, to do some catching up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I won't say good morning or good afternoon since you might be watching this at midnight on a blurs day, also known as any other day during this pandemic. Welcome to the year in review, session S20, viruses and CF, the good, bad and the ugly. Ahmed and I are moderating the year in review session and you can't look back on 2019, 2020 without talking about viruses and the impact of those viruses through this fantastic through this pandemic during the era of modulators. Dr. Marty Solomon will be going into detail about modulators in this session and others will be talking about COVID and bacteriophage, but we thought it was important to touch on it here, even if very superficially. I'm Melanie Shin, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. And my name is Ahmed Euler, and I'm here 
uh, Adult CF Program Director at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital. Melanie, it is great to moderate this session with you and to do this talk. How are things in Canada and how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. It's getting rather chilly up here. How are you guys? Well, we're okay, but I can sum it up in a Turkish phrase I like to use these days. İç güveysinden halice. Oh my God, you're a bit better than a son-in-law living in his wife's parents' house? That's yeah, unfortunate. Well, that is unfortunate, and I love that saying, and that about sums things up. Um, but anyway, so we can move on. And we have no disclosures, either of us. So The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is a classic movie that pushed Clint Eastwood into stardom. And it is considered a spaghetti Western, which I learned is due to the producers and directors being from Italy. It was released in 1966, but despite that, it has remained a popular um, uh, term and title that's used in many presentations. In this case, we're going to talk about the good. And the good is the bacteriophage. These are viruses that essentially translate to viruses that feed on bacteria, or they called bacteria eaters. They essentially target a virus, attach themselves, then inject their DNA or penetrate um, in the penetration uh, phase and take over the bacteria's business during the biosynthesis phase, followed by maturation, and finally the lysis phase where these phages are free to interact with other bacteria, and this goes on until the bacteria are gone. Now, they've been utilized since the early 1900s, starting in France, following use in chickens. They were successfully used to treat five patients with dysentery in 1921. However, inconsistent results and other challenges like contamination of the phage cocktails, rapid clearance, developing resistance, and how in vitro um, did not necessarily translate into in vivo uh, observations led to a more limited use, and especially after antibiotics were discovered. And these were uh, Dr. Phages, though, do still have a limited uh, use in Russia, Poland, and Georgia. But there's been renewed interest um, given its promise in the era of multidrug resistant and extreme drug resistant organisms. And advantages are that they have low toxicity, effectiveness in some multidrug resistant infections. They self replicate and can co evolve with bacteria. Highly specific, so no off target friendly fire. And what made it interesting for CF is that they can also penetrate biofilm. It can also be delivered by topical, intravenous, and inhaled uh, methods. A famous case involved a 15-year-old CF patient who was post-lung transplant in the UK and who was being actively treated for an abscesses eight years prior to transplant. Following transplant, this patient unfortunately developed disseminated disease involving progression on chest x-ray uh, with a consolidation, development of skin lesions that were positive for abscesses, poor lung function response, and findings also on PET CT. The patient received a three-phage cocktail, uh, two were bioengineered, and also delivered topically and intravenously. As you can see here, skin lesions, including those on the sternal wound, improved. Findings on whole scanned uh, PET CT 12 weeks before and six weeks, six weeks after, um, in comparison, shows improvement of the sternal wound um, and some of the soft tissue signals. And in the cross-sectional images of that PET CT, we can see abdominal lymph nodes um, also significantly improve. Um, and here you can see stabilization of lung function based on FEV1 uh, and FEC uh, in different colors here uh, once the phage uh, was deployed and stabilized. Now, there are other case studies involving Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which we don't have time to review here, um, but that the bacteriophage certainly shows some promise um, as we move forward. And we were all here in 2018 when the CF Foundation announced in a $100 million infection research initiative supporting industry and academic researchers and have followed through with a $5 million award to Armada Pharmaceuticals who are about to enroll 
a phase 1b2 randomized clinical, uh, controlled clinical trial. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing more about bacteriophages and some of the uh, potential um, a great role they might play in treating infection with our patients. The bad in this case is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 infection. We all quote the number 50 to 60% of exacerbations are triggered by viral illnesses and the assumption was that SARS-CoV-2 will cause similar morbidity in CF patients. However, CF uh, infections compared to the general population um, have uh, been lower and now realize that there are far more exacerbations that are associated with viruses. Um, now, the, this, this information will definitely be outdated by the time that you're watching this. And hopefully as uh, Melanie and I moderate this session, we may uh, get to provide you with some updates, but there will also be um, other sessions in NAFCFC that will be talking about this and will likely give you uh, much more up-to-date numbers. Um, but as of 9-17-2020, there are 212 cases confirmed with over 3,300 uh, unique people tested. As you can see, a great majority of those who are positive were adults. Um, a, a, about you know, a third of those patients were hospitalized with once again, a majority of them being adults and 24 had advanced lung disease. Um, and 12 were post-lung transplant with one death each in those two categories. Um, and one interesting thing to note about this is that those deaths have not changed since, um, since the spring. And thus we know that we're doing, um, doing a really good job with, uh, with taking care of uh, people once they are infected. Um, the European Society has also been doing a great job tracking the numbers, European CF Society. Um, as you can see here, they have data from 18 countries with 162 cases reported, um, though they do note that 144 of those um, are documented. The ages, once again, um, are predominantly those between uh, over 18. Um, 93 of those were mild cases, six severe, five critical, and, um, and here are some of the symptoms that, uh, and clinical findings that patients presented with, um, which exacerbation is uh, number one. Um, but three did eventually uh, did succumb to having uh, their COVID-19 illness. And once again, this number has not changed um, since, uh, since uh, about the spring and thus highlighting um, that we're learning as we go and doing a much better job in, in, uh, in mitigating the complications of COVID-19. Now, there are many um, lectures that you're gonna be hearing on COVID-19, on epidemiology, um, on the role of telehealth, infection control, mental health. Um, I did wanna highlight um, you know, the proposed use of Dornis Alpha in patients with ARDS um, during, due to COVID-19. Um, there's a study that is out of France uh, that I included here, but also uh, my colleague here at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital, Mira Subramanian, is also uh, ready to enroll patients, enroll patients in a clinical trial that's going on here. And really the idea, and for those who are not aware of this, came from autopsy observations in China described as lungs stuffed with mucus, something that we're used to um, knowing a lot about. And it was this um, that you know this observation of uh, mucus hypersecretion as a direct consequence of uh, you know um, of the direct activation of glandular epithelial cells, airway epithelial cell subtypes most strongly expressing ACE2, the receptor that facilitates COVID-19 infection, and it was the ACE2 receptor activation also known to increase neutrophil influx um, in infected lung and DNA release from these neutrophils. Um, form neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. And this is one strategy that we're using Dornis Alpha to disrupt these nets. And now this is a double blind placebo controlled study on its way to evaluate clinical efficacy of DNAs in mechanically ventilated patients, not just CF uh, and mostly not CF. And I just thought it was uh, interesting given Dornis Alpha's connection to CF and its potential role in keeping CF patients from getting sick um, or getting sicker if infected with COVID-19 um, and, uh, and a drug that they're already using. Now for the ugly. So the ugly 
this year's access to Alexa Captor, Teza Captor, Iva Captor. So last year, we all heard about the wonders of this drug that we can see summarized here, namely the absolute increase in lung function and decrease in rate of pulmonary exacerbations. In fact, many of us have seen this in our patients firsthand. However, as we all know, there are differences between our health systems worldwide. As this is the North American CF conference, I chose to big, pick the biggest difference I could find between Canada and the US, seen here. Um, but in addition to our political leaders, worldwide access to Trikafta is a major frustration for people living with CF. As demonstrated on this map, we can, or, sorry, there's no map, but a few examples are outlined below, um, and we can see that access varies widely. In the US, FDA approval was rushed in October 2019, and currently it's covered by both private and public insurance programs. In Canada, it's available by compassionate access only, and not yet Health Canada approved or even applied for coverage. In Australia, it's available as well by compassionate access only, however, currently under consideration by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. And in the UK, licensed by European Medicines Agency, and the National Health Service has recently reached an agreement for access this summer, and access is anticipated soon. So why does this matter? Well, a study published by St. Michael's Hospital and Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto performed a micro simulation model using CF Canada data, uh, data from the registry and published phase three data on the treatment effect demonstrating the effects of delaying access. The bottom line was that early access decreased the number of patients with severe lung disease, reduced pulmonary exacerbations, and is projected to improve survival by 9.2 years, a frankly staggering number considering the current median survival of our patients. So folks, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly, which brings us to the unknown. The effects of climate change, natural, natural disasters on our air quality, living conditions, economies, undoubtedly affects all of us, um, and definitely our patients living with CF. So we want to thank you, Melanie and I, for joining our short session here today. And we will be moderating the session uh, during the CF conference live session, where we'll be also taking questions and answering them for you, along with our uh, uh, the other uh, presenters in this session. And we look forward to seeing you then.